Good morning, welcome to Grand Rounds. Thanks for coming. I see some new faces. I, think some, we have some, I know we have some visiting medical students and, and uh, some of the new PATH fellows are here. So, um, but uh, we have a great presentation this morning by Dr. Uh, Dr. Jim Bell. He's been our, he's one of the interns and currently on rotation with us at the VA. He's done a fantastic job. It's a job that goes, it's kind of a thankless job. It, it's invaluable to us as chiefs absolutely invaluable. He does so much and um, he does a really good job at it. He comes from us from, I'm going to say this wrong, Louisville or Louisville. There's, you have to ask him to say it. It's, it's pretty how he, sees it, how he says it. But he's going to be talking to us today about orbital cellulitis and it's <coughs> his, his, uh, the, the topic title is a stagnant diagnosis or an evolving disease. Jim. Thanks, Snow. I actually, uh, on my drive in this morning, I heard she thinks my tractor's sexy on the radio, and it made me think of high school dances. <laughs> so um, anyway, I am the intern on the service right now at the VA, and one of the jobs of the intern over there is to help with all the consults at the VA and to help with um, all of the buddy call with residents on Friday afternoon, or Friday evening, and then Saturday during the day. And one of the common consults that we got uh, seemed pretty common to me, was to help rule in or out orbital cellulitis and also to help come up with a treatment regimen if it was ruled in. So I thought it was an appropriate uh, disease to talk a little bit about today, and I thought we'd start with a case that we saw early on. <coughs> so one Saturday when we were over at Primary Children's, we got called about a patient uh, who was in the emergency department, and he was a five-year-old boy, came in with periorbital swelling and erythema. Uh, ocular pain, all of this on the right eye. He had a red eye as well. Uh, weeks before he came in, he'd wrecked his bike and ended up with a black eye, um, but it had resolved before his presentation. It was uh, back to normal, at least in appearance, uh, before he ended up with this new swelling. And he didn't have any other significant past medical or ocular history other than this uh, black eye. He was a pretty healthy little boy. So his vital signs when he first came in were a blood pressure of 106 over 53, heart rate of 118, respiratory rate 26, and a, he had a fever of 40.4 degrees Celsius. Uh, physical exam, also all on the right, he had an injected conge, pain with ocular movements, erythematous and edematous lids, and he had a few labs that were important. He had a leukocytosis, a white count of 15.7, and a CRP when he first came in was 5.9, it increased to 7.1 by the following morning. Blood cultures were drawn, they didn't actually end up growing any organisms at any point in time. And a CT of his orbits showed tissue swelling within uh, his orbits along with air in the orbits on the right. So as you can probably guess from the title of my talk, <laughs> he was diagnosed with orbital cellulitis. Uh, and this was all prior to when we actually met the patient. Um, he was admitted to the hospital, started on some antibiotics which were changed around, and he ended up on ceftriaxone and clindamycin. He then developed an allergic, what was thought to be an allergic reaction because he had throat swelling and uh, a rash that developed and he was switched to erdipenem, according to the infectious disease team's recs. And he got better and was discharged to home uh, with erdipenem via a pick line. And uh, that's not the end of his story. I'll leave you with a cliffhanger because we actually met him later on, but uh, we'll come back to that later. So a couple of definitions most in this room are probably familiar with. Preceptal cellulitis is the inflammation of the tissue anterior to the orbital septum, and orbital cellulitis is inflammation of the fatty tissue uh, and muscles within the orbit. And there's a whole spectrum of severity with these diseases. Uh, on initial presentation, they can look really similar, and even uh, some forms of conjunctivitis can look similar as well, but it's really important to distinguish them early on because uh, the consequences of these diseases and the treatment regimens are really different. So right from the start, uh, it's good to have a strong idea of what you're dealing with. Uh, and further, uh, further physical exam and imaging help make this possible. So the origin of the infections is different. Usually preceptal cellulitis occurs because of a break in the skin barrier, and then orbital cellulitis uh, often is associated with uh, some form of sinusitis. And out of the paranasal sinuses, the ethmoid sinuses are the most commonly involved. Orbital cellulitis can come from lots of other uh, associated infections as well. Erysipelas, impetigo, odontogenic infections septic thrombophlebitis, penetrating trauma to cryocystitis, and then retrograde flow through orbital veins are some of them, um, more common than a lot of others. 
It has a lot to do with the anatomy of the area involved. Uh, the lamina papyracea is the most thin portion of the medial wall of the orbit. Uh, it's also the lateral border of the ethmoid air cells, so it would make sense that ethmoid sinusitis is the most common form of sinusitis associated with orbital cellulitis. Uh, it's got lots of natural bony defects, so debris can just go back and forth between those two spaces. Orbital veins are also important and interesting because they actually don't have any valves, so it's, in, it's easy for an infection to spread in either direction along those veins. And unfortunately, they kind of act as a highway to the cavernous sinus, um, so that's an important aspect of this disease as well. Jane and Rubin wrote a series of papers uh, where they sort of classified a spectrum of orbital cellulitis, and within that spectrum, they included preceptal cellulitis uh, as sort of the least severe form. They also uh, bumped up to orbital cellulitis with or without intracranial complications, and then orbital abscess with or without uh, intracranial complications, and that can be subdivided into a subperiosteal abscess or a true uh, orbital abscess. So to start with uh, their least severe form of the disease, preceptal cellulitis, the patient can present with uh, edema, erythema, pain, leukocytosis. Uh, and so this can be really scary for the patient. As you can see in that picture, it can have um, quite a devastating look to it, but if you press a little further, the patient should be able to move their eyes without any extra pain. They shouldn't have any proptosis and their vision shouldn't be affected by this disease. If any of those are present, it should raise some red flags, but if, they're, if all those findings are absent, um, those are all good signs. <coughs> the infection isn't limited to the orbit, so it's fairly easy for it to extend along the skin of the face, get to areas such as the cheeks. Other things to consider are uh, adenoviral conjunctivitis and things like contact dermatitis. Uh, but this is not a life-threatening disease. Uh, it's really scary for the patient, like I mentioned. It's often caused by uh, strep pneumo or staph aureus, uh, which would make sense because it's associated with breaks in the skin barrier a lot of the time. Uh, and because it's um, often caused by those common organisms and, and not often life-threatening, it can usually be treated on an outpatient basis with oral antibiotics like amoxicillin clavulanate or um, and the recovery is usually quick and dramatic. And by that, I mean within a couple days, the patient should notice a difference uh, in how they feel and their appearance. And if they don't, then it might be time to rethink things. Orbital cellulitis, on the other hand, is, is quite different. It can lead to blindness, cavernous sinus thrombosis, meningitis, epidural, subdural abscess, and brain abscess. And any of those, uh, or some of those can lead to death even. So it's not something that you want to get mixed up right off the bat. It's good to distinguish between the two diseases right away. Unfortunately, like preceptal cellulitis, orbital cellulitis presents with a lot of the same things. The patient can come in with the edema, hyperemia, pain, leukocytosis, and uh, the appearance, uh, as you can see in this picture, it's not necessarily on initial exam um, more severe looking than the preceptal cellulitis. So they can look pretty similar uh, right off the bat. But if you press a little further, if the patient does have any of the things we talked about before, like proptosis, if they can't move their eye in a certain direction, if they have extra pain with eye movement, or if their vision's compromised, or they have an APD, uh, again, those are red flags to be raised because something else may be going on. So just to go through a typical presentation of a patient with orbital cellulitis, uh, there was this 68-year-old gentleman a uh, history of prostate cancer and hypertension, otherwise a really healthy patient, came in with a day of right upper lid edema and right eye pain and proptosis uh, and restricted lateral gaze with his right eye. So, so far, um, seems pretty much like orbital cellulitis. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, imaging for uh, diagnosis of this disease later, but a CT of his orbits showed a preceptal uh, inflammation with a subperiosteal collection over the right lateral orbital wall. So the arrows kind of pointed out here. Um, so a pretty large collection there, so they thought it was an abscess, and he was admitted and started on broad-spectrum antibiotics, uh, which should have been adequate to cover whatever was causing this infection. But he didn't actually improve in 48 hours, so they took him to the operating room, and this collection was drained. And it actually didn't uh, show anything growing, but it did show metastatic prostate cancer. So that just sort of throws out the key point that even though it looks and smells like orbital cellulitis, that might not actually be what the patient has. And it's important to keep a good differential on board like it is with all diseases. They pressed a little further with the history and got in touch with this oncologist and found out that he'd had a prostatectomy and received chemotherapy years prior uh, and had been in remission, but unfortunately it obviously recurred. So he was started on oral corticosteroids, which helped his ocular symptoms resolve. 
and he was discharged, followed up with his oncologist, and unfortunately passed away eight months later. So uh, it is important to remember that uh, other diseases could be causing um, these same symptoms. Examples of this are things like sarcoidosis, tumors like leukemia, lymphoma, and retinoblastoma, thyroid disease, and also trauma. So um, if a patient's on what you would consider proper treatment coverage uh, and they're not getting any better, it might be time to rethink what might actually be going on. So labs can be helpful with this disease as well. A CBC, like our patient had, uh, can show a leukocytosis, but it's not necessary. It's uh, more common in orbital cellulitis than it is in preceptal cellulitis, but it doesn't rule in or out either disease. Blood cultures can be real helpful, but unfortunately, most of the time, they're not, uh, they don't come back positive. Uh, one large study I read showed that they're positive in about a third of children less than four years old. This number seemed pretty high compared to a lot of the other smaller uh, chart reviews that I was reading, but those reviews also included older patients, so I think that had an effect on their numbers. Just 5% of adults with orbital cellulitis will actually have a positive blood culture, though, so it's not positive often, but when it is positive, it's helpful in determining a treatment regimen. Cerebral spinal fluid analysis uh, can also be helpful, but it's not typically a lab that you would order on these patients. Um, usually you would just get it if the patient has bilateral disease or central nervous system involvement. Otherwise, uh, it's usually not, not a good lab to get. Imaging is one of the mainstay, mainstays of diagnosis for this disease. A CT with contrast is the test of choice. Uh, it's best for determining the presence of um, an associated sinusitis. It can help distinguish between preceptal and orbital cellulitis. It can also help um, classify and determine if an abscess is present and also if there's any central nervous system involvement. So CT is the test of choice. Interestingly, ultrasound actually has a higher resolution. Uh, it just doesn't give you any idea of what's going on in the posterior third of the orbit, which is why it's not the, the um, first choice to test. Uh, and MRI is generally thought to be more helpful for cavernous sinus thrombosis than it is for uh, orbital cellulitis. Imaging, uh, so this is just an example of a CT with an abscess. I thought it was a cool picture. <laughs> but it's a fungal subperiosteal abscess that's sort of eaten through the wall of the medial orbit, or the medial wall of the left, or of the right, of the left orbit. So pathogens that are commonly involved with orbital cellulitis include strep pneumo and staph aureus, uh, but not far behind them are uh, s other species of strep, non-typable H flu, uh, and non-spore forming anaerobes. You, unfortunately, you cannot really predict the organism based on the symptoms of the patient. Uh, they can all present with the symptoms we talked about earlier. But you can make a guess, and the older the patient is, the more likely it is that there are going to be more than one organism involved, and also uh, the more likely anaerobes are going to be involved as well. So one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about today was how this disease, its management, its diagnosis might be changing now uh, as, compared, as compared to before. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about more recent changes later on, but uh, sort of a big seismic shift from what I understood in the literature was that before 1985, H. flu was actually pretty common um, as a culprit for this disease. And so this wonderful vaccination came out and changed all that. Uh, a lot of people at one point in time considered that lumbar punctures were uh, something that should be gotten if you were concerned about uh, orbital cellulitis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, now they're more, more often just gotten if there's actually central nervous system involvement. Uh, but before it was really um, part of the mainstay of diagnosis. So this vaccination really changed the, changed the way this disease was approached. Uh, orbital cellulitis treatment um, should be started before the organism is identified. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the chances of a blood culture coming back positive are not good. So it's better to just start uh, broad spectrum antibiotics early on. The antibiotics should cover strep pneumo, staph aureus, and other strep species, so the, the big ones that I mentioned. But it, it can also cover gram negative organisms and anaerobes if you think the patient has a high likelihood of having those involved in the infection. And it should be IV for at least three days or until the symptoms are improving for seven days if bacteremia is actually present. So more specifically, nafcillin is good for covering gram positives, it was recommended clindamycin for anaerobes, and cefotaxin for gram negatives uh, and resistant gram positives. Some authors uh, argue that ceftriaxone was usually sufficient for patients under nine years old, uh, 
but a lot of times uh, clindamycin is, is included, especially for patients older than nine, because then you have a bigger chance of anaerobic involvement, and ceftriaxone won't be sufficient in those cases. Vancomycin is suggested if the patient has a penicillin allergy, and then ticrosillin coagulinate, ampicillin sulbactam, and piperacillin tazobactam are uh, commonly used just because they cover so many different organisms. Nasal decongestants are often thrown in as well because they can help the patient drain their sinuses if there is an associated sinusitis with the orbital cellulitis. So I've talked about the uh, medical management of this disease, but there's a big surgical component as well. But the patients don't always need surgery, so uh, there are uh, specific indications for taking the patient to the operating room. One of them is if there's uh, optic nerve or retinal compromise due to a mass effect. Sometimes in these cases, campylysis or campotomy are needed uh, right away, but even if those are performed, uh, the patient's probably still going to need to be taken to the operating room for actual drainage of the abscess. Severe pain to the abscess is also a possible indication for surgery. And then worsening of vision or extraocular motility after 48 hours of antibiotics. We saw this in the patient uh, that I talked about earlier. Um, he was on what was considered proper treatment but he didn't get any better, and it turned out he didn't even have orbital cellulitis. Uh, other ways that this could possibly be helpful is if the antibiotics you have the patient on are not adequately covering the organism involved, and if there's an abscess that the antibiotics just aren't penetrating. So any of those is a, is a good reason to take the patient to the operating room. It has been found that serial CTs over the first one or two days really aren't very helpful. Um, the patient might be improving clinically, but the images won't show much of a difference. So it's, if you do want repeat imaging, uh, it usually won't show too much of a difference unless you wait more than a couple days. So I mentioned that not every patient always needs to be taken to the OR. Some authors actually argue that that's true, but most seem to believe that like all surgeries, uh, abscess drainage has its inherent risks. and. Some patients will get better without needing uh, the operating room, so it's best to let them improve with just antibiotics. Uh, there are risks with the surgery, like seeding of infection elsewhere or start starting a new infection that wasn't there to begin with. It is a general rule, younger patients tend to respond better to just antibiotics without surgical intervention. But the BCSC provides uh, sort of a list of criteria for at least strongly considering the operating room. So if a patient has any of the following, if they're older than nine years old, if they have frontal sinusitis, a non-medial location in the abscess, a large abscess, anaerobic infection or dental uh, infection as well, which are related, or evidence of chronic sinusitis or optic nerve were compromised. Those are all strong reasons to consider taking the patient to the operating room. So I'm going to switch gears here a little bit and talk a little more about how this disease might be changing now. Uh, you hear a lot about MRSA in the news, but also uh, in the medical literature. The infectious disease doctors at the university actually uh, have made an argument that it should be considered a separate organism altogether from MSSA because it's gotten to where it's not only resistant to different antibiotics, but it behaves in a different fashion, especially the community-acquired version of the disease. Uh, it's much more aggressive, and even with proper antibiotic coverage, it might take a few uh, operating room trips for abscess drainage for infections other than orbital cellulitis before the disease is finally controlled. So I was wondering how it was affecting uh, these particular diseases, preceptal and orbital cellulitis, uh, and if there were any new recommendations for how these patients should be treated and um, how they should be monitored. So there weren't any real large studies on this, but there were a number of case series and retrospective chart reviews uh, concerning how how MRSA may be affecting this disease. One of them was a case series published in 2009 that looked at uh, 11 cases of MRSA um, preceptal cellulitis. And these authors noticed that these cases seemed to be more aggressive, which is why they decided to write it up. Um, there were sort of two different groups of patients. One of them was teenagers. And they seemed to have these focal abscesses that the authors described as uh, easy to drain. And they did well with antibiotic, outpatient antibiotic treatment. So this seemed to behave a lot more like uh, your typical preceptal cellulitis that could be monitored on an outpatient basis. However, uh, the other group was the adults. They had infections that spread rapidly along different tissue planes with multiple abscesses, even once the patient was already on an antibiotic that should have been covering MRSA. They needed hospitalization, IV treatment, uh, multiple surgeries, and some of them, uh, the authors believe that uh, 
steroids help them get over the infection. So I, I think they were really making the argument that, you know, sometimes uh, if MRSA is involved, it can be a much more aggressive infection and require a different approach. This is radically different than what I was talking about earlier, which is sort of the, the status quo for treatment of preceptal cellulitis, which is that, you know, it's not a terribly dangerous disease and it can be treated outpatient. Um, but, but all of a sudden, these patients are needing multiple surgeries and multiple days of in-house IV antibiotics. So it, it could be changing the way this is approached, but I don't think the authors were arguing that it's, it's common enough that, that all patients need to be monitored for this. I think uh, the idea was that basically, uh, if a patient's not improving the way you would anticipate them to improve, or if they come in with a description of a disease that came on way faster and way more aggressively than you would expect a typical preceptal cellulitis, then maybe it would be con good to consider that uh, this particular organism might be involved. So I like this cartoon. <laughs> um, so MRSA and orbital cellulitis uh, was sort of the bigger one that I wanted to look at. And there was a retrospective chart review at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston where they looked at uh, diseases, orbital cellulitis associated with sinusitis. That was their main inclusion criteria for these cases from 2001 to 2005. Um, out of the cases that they ended up looking at, nine out of nine orbital aspirates, 13 out of 16 sinus aspirates, and two out of 27 blood cultures ended up actually being positive. Um, and out of those positive blood culture, or out of those positive cultures in general, the most common organism they encountered was Staph aureus with the most common subtype being MRSA. Um, all of the MRSA that they identified was sensitive to clindamycin or vancomycin or both. Uh, and from what I gathered from this review, all of these patients ended up doing well. Um, they didn't really focus on uh, how the course of the patient may have differed depending on the organism involved. They were mostly looking at what type of organism was involved. There were a few shortcomings uh, with this particular study, um, just inherent to the nature of the disease itself. One of them was that um, basically if, if you break it down, almost all of these positive cultures came from surgical specimens. So essentially, it, it still doesn't give a great idea uh, as to how many of the cases in the larger group that didn't have an abscess drainage uh, were actually MRSA. Um, you really just get a better idea of uh, what the surgical patients actually had infecting them. But I, I think the authors really kind of wanted to point out that um, it might be good to at least consider MRSA in these patients. I don't think that they were arguing, and I don't think that you can take it from this paper since it's a relatively small number of cases that empiric treatment should uh, include coverage for MRSA because we just don't have huge numbers for that kind of projection. Um, interestingly, they only had one case of strep pneumo out of these cases. Uh, they thought that maybe that was due to the expansion of the vaccine to infants, but they, that was just speculation. They also made the recommendation not to obtain blood cultures based on the low yield they got. I actually disagree with that recommendation. Um, it is a low yield, uh, certainly in this case and in other studies that I looked at, but if that blood culture does come back positive, it can provide invaluable information as to what type of antibiotic you need to be using to treat the patient. So um, there were uh, more smaller studies uh, for MRSA involved in orbital cellulitis, a number of studies involving infants, I'll just use one as an example here, but uh, many of them were similar. There was a two-month-old boy with MRSA associated with orbital cellulitis. To make a long story short, he had bacteremia and multiple abscesses. He was on vancomycin and neurotenum, and in spite of this, he kept developing abscesses and kept needing drainage in the operating room. Eventually, he got over the hump, and he, he did quite well after he was discharged. But um, this and other cases uh, led to the argument that MRSA may be more commonly associated with bacteremia than other organisms, and it may lead to uh, more abscesses even when they're on proper antibiotic coverage. So uh, these authors were kind of making that same argument that the authors of the preceptal cellulitis study made, which is that uh, this type of infection is much more aggressive. Um, even when you're on top of things, they might still develop abscesses, so it needs a higher level of, uh, higher level of care and more aggressive treatment. Um, than other organisms. And it, it seemed like when they mentioned it, it was more often the community-acquired version of the disease than the nos nosocomial disease version of the disease. They argued 
uh, for initial treatment with vancomycin or even clindamycin, uh, and including trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole in these patients' regimens when they're discharged from the hospital. I, I think that's reasonable if you know that you're dealing with MRSA, but I don't think that you can really uh, project their results to the general patient population, which is, I think, what they may have been doing. Um, because it is such small numbers, it doesn't really give an idea of the incidence of the disease. It just gives the idea that when it is present, uh, it can be quite aggressive. So again, if the patient's not improving the way you would anticipate them to improve, MRSA may be an organism to consider as, as the reason for that. There were a couple of large studies. Um, one of them was done in Houston. They looked at positive, uh, they looked at infections anywhere in the body that ended up being positive uh, for MRSA from 2000 to 2004. They looked at over 3,600 cases, and out of all those cases, only 49 of them actually involved the eye. And out of those 49 cases involving the eye, the most common type of infection was uh, preceptal cellulitis. Um, aside from preceptal cellulitis, there was a spectrum of other disorders. Uh, it wasn't just orbital cellulitis. They included things like uh, corneal ulcer and, and endophthalmitis. Um, but the only trend they noticed in their study was that as the years went on, community-acquired MRSA was increasing, but the nosocomial subtype was not. Uh, but at the same time, you know, it's a fairly uh, small number of cases uh, to make any huge conjecture from. So this is kind of the way I feel by this point in the talk, and I thought it would be good to kind of play devil's advocate with myself. So there's another chart review for pediatric cases at a children's hospital in Aurora, Colorado from 2004 to 2009. Their inclusion criteria were that these cases had to be confirmed by CT exams, so it had to be present on imaging. Um, they had a number of exclusion criteria, though. Uh, no patients with malignancy, any type of immunodeficiency, an anatomic abnormality, trauma, uh, or previous surgery, or a preceptal infection could be included. So they ruled out quite a number of types of patients. Um, in the end, similar to the last uh, chart review, they ended up with only 4% of their blood cultures, uh, but 81% of their sp surgical specimens coming back uh, with positive, positive results. And out of 94 patients in the study, only 9% actually had Staph aureus as the primary organism. And out of that 9%, only one patient actually had MRSA. So not all these studies agree with each other. Um, yet in spite of these results, uh, as the years went on, it increased, but depending on the year, 14 to 57 percent of these patients were receiving vancomycin as uh, part of their antibiotic regimen. So some, some clinicians certainly are using vancomycin more often, and presumably not because the patient had any type of allergy, but because they were uh, concerned about um, MRSA being involved in the infection. And I think these authors were just kind of trying to make the point that it may not be necessary at this point in time to include that in part of an empiric regimen. Um, it may only be necessary if you find that that's what the patient actually has. And again, these studies are kind of limited um, in one fashion because the, the results that we're getting that we're using are, for the most part, from abscess drainage. So it might be that a different uh, type of organisms involved when no abscess is formed, they might behave differently in those situations. It's kind of hard to speculate in that sense. Interestingly, as a side note, uh, strep anginosis was the most identified organism for these patients, and I actually had to look that up. I think that qualifies as part of the other strep species, but it's normal flora of the GI, GU, and respiratory tracts. So conveniently, um, in the April uh, issue of the Journal of Emergency Medicine, there was a study published from our own Department of Pharmacy at University Hospital where they looked at patients who came into the ER at University Hospital with some sort of soft tissue or skin infection uh, with MRSA. Uh, and they just looked at what antibiotics these uh, MRSA subtypes were susceptible to. Um, so if you're wondering what antibiotic in our own community to use, uh, 58 out of 58 were susceptible to vancomycin or uh, some other antibiotic on this list. 57 out of 58 were susceptible to Bactrim. 50 were susceptible to tetracycline, and only 47 were susceptible to clindamycin. So the strains in this community seem to be more susceptible to uh, vancomycin and Bactrim than they are to clindamycin, at least at, at University Hospital. So back to our original case, uh, the cliffhanger. Um, within 24 hours of discharge, really more like within half a day, this patient came back to the ER, and that was where we met him that Saturday. 
uh, and his parents were saying that he couldn't any longer look up with his right eye and his right eye had become more red. Exams showed that he wasn't febrile this time around, but uh, like his parents said, he did have limited upgaze on the right. And a CT showed a newly formed multiloculated abscess, including a large portion against the orbital roof. So with the criteria we talked about before, um, he has three of them at least to go to the OR. One was that he wasn't improving on a proper antibiotic regimen. He had a large abscess and it wasn't medial in location. So he was taken to the OR and it was drained and it grew group A strip. <laughs> so not all these cases are MRSA involving. Um, sometimes common things are common. And he was continued after his gain of generative hernum and discharge to home and he did really well. So um, just a little overview of how the disease might be changing with MRSA evolving as a more common organism. And I can take any questions that anybody has. So, um, this is in the setting as part of a, a group prosecution, and uh, uh, this is not just pediatric MRSA as far as that population, but it's specifically interested in what the incidence was of MRSA and MRSC use. And I understand that from the demographic data that you indicated. And um, the results of that work were pretty interesting. And this was uh, all this in the early 1800s. Uh, the, the average Thank you. 
I've been reading that. One of the ones I was coming across was linazolid. Is that I, I was reading that linazolid is a lot of times the first line of the MRSA is resistant to vancomycin. I don't know yeah, if that's, that's what other people have come across, but yeah. Yeah. 
at the University Hospital in Louisville, you actually had to get infectious disease approval before you could give anyone linazolid, but it's kind of a drop in the bucket if that's going on in the poultry industry. I don't think that would be too much good in some situations. Yeah. The argument was bilateral disease only, but I came across that once um, in multiple cases. Um, so it, it was bilateral disease only, um, but I haven't heard of that personally um, in my brief time with exposure to ophthalmology, but uh, that was their argument. 